Overtime was created by Matt Holman, founder of the EMW Foundation, and is made possible by the Prodigy Media Group and RPM Athlete Performance. With inspirational credit to my friend, Dr. Fred O'B. Welcome to Overtime, an open conversation series on racism in the sport of lacrosse. We hope you find this thought-provoking, educational, and it leaves you better prepared as a member of the lacrosse community. Thanks again for joining us, and now for this week's panel. Due to my error in hitting the record button, we join the conversation already in progress, and you'll meet the panelists at the end of the video. Um, you know, experiences. Um, for me down here, it's never been, and, and I put this out to my, my kids and parents, uh, in particular the parents, uh, every year. Um, in fact, we do a meeting at, in like September, October, and then we do another one right before the season. And I laid it out very plainly that, that the program isn't about wins and losses. We're all competitive here, but it's about developing young men. And part of that development is making sure that we have these dialogues. And part of the, it's, it's making sure that we provide some experiences for them to, um, you know, among other things, whether it's leadership, whatever, but also to experience uh, giving back to the game and, and to engaging with other people and engaging with our community. Um, and so we, we do certain community service efforts that, and we don't necessarily promote them to the school or tell anybody we're going to do them. We just do them because that's what's, as a coach, I set that standard that that's important to us. Giving back is important to us. And, and so we go into some scenarios that, you know, maybe our kids otherwise would never engage. They'd never be in those environments or those neighborhoods or whatever it is. And it's not about, um, you know, it is to some degree about actually the actual work that's being done, but it's also about providing them that experience and, and giving them something uh, that hopefully uh, informs their life and informs their, um, you know, their habits and their dialogue and their, you know, everything that they do moving forward. So this is actually an area of programming that we're, <laughs> is very important to us um, because if you play Harlem lacrosse, if you play lacrosse at a Harlem lacrosse program, you're likely on a team that is almost exclusively minority students. That's your first experience playing lacrosse. Um, and then we have a lot of students who are enrolled in boarding school that are predominantly white institutions where then they go from, my, my team was entirely black kids to now it's, I'm one of a couple of black players on the team. And so we've been thinking hard and trying to develop programming for how we support students. It's not just about their experience on the team, it's also their experience in the, school, in the whole school. And I, I think as we're learning, um, to like Rory said, I think one of the most important things is to listen. And like Chad said, you sort of, you're already setting up yourself up when you are establishing the values of your program. Um, but I think we're trying to, um, we've played in a few very specific instances, like We've, we've really done some important advocacy for our students. So I think like having a really open dialogue with your students so that they know they can come to you if they, if they need to, if they're like, hey, this, this feels uncomfortable to me. I'm one of only a student, few students of color. I don't really know who's the person I go to who's like, I can say, I, I don't, I'm not comfortable with what's going on here or it's making me feel a certain way. Like we try to be that person so that, a, you know, if something comes up, you know, we had some stuff that came up with COVID that was sort of like every boarding school sending all their kids home. And they have certain expectations of their students and they're like, they weren't doing a good job thinking about the perspective of the kids who are in Harlem lacrosse relative to their other students, which they're dealing with a lot of different things. You know, if you're living in, um, in, in the city of Manhattan, you know, a lot of population density, then you're a lot more likely to know someone who's been killed by COVID and your life is probably turned upside down a lot more um, than someone who lives in a suburban community and has access to, uh, to like any digital resource that they need and they, they can really support the remote learning very easily. And the school wasn't thinking about it, you know, and it was our job to sort of like advocate for the student in that way. And the students like, I, you know, my school's all over me and like I have a lot going on. And so I think, um, as a coach, like establishing really authentic relationships with your students and a deep level of trust so that a the kid could come to you and say like, 
hey, this is what's going on is a is like an an important step, you know, um, so that kids feel comfortable saying, hey, like this is something I'm going through. It might be unique since I'm one of only a few students of color on this team, but I got to have somebody I can go to. And um, that's, you know, that's a lot easier said than done. That takes, I think, like the way that you manage your relationship with your kids, like all the time. But if you do it right, I think that you can, you can be a really important support system. I think it's important to note too, that um, when addressing this, uh, even again, the fact that you have two black students have very different experiences and different ways they like to be approached. I could speak for myself where I would say that I wouldn't want my head coach to approach me about anything. <laughs> I just prefer that like, I would deal with it internally. That's my personality. Um, if I needed to talk to someone, it probably wouldn't be my head coach anyway, because I just, that wasn't what my direction that I would go. Um, whereas another player might be like, I want to be approached and I want people to talk to me and I want to feel like I have an open forum here. So the reality is you can't approach them the same. Um, but it is advantageous that this person has two coaches of color on their coaching staff, because that's pretty rare, um, especially if you're thinking like you in youth high school level. Um, so utilizing them uh, is really important. I used to coach college before I worked at US Lacrosse, and I know that um, it was a very different experience as assistant coach. I was like best friends with the kids. I like knew their situation. It was a lot more social. I, I could play good cop. Um, when I went to head coaching, it was completely different. And, you know, it was almost like, wait, why are they not talking to me about everything in their life? But that was something that obviously I transitioned into my assistant coach became that role. Um, so the reality is not only do you have two assistant coaches, but they are minority coaches. So the reality is that they're probably going to be much more approachable for a lot of different reasons. So uh, utilize them in their roles, empower them to speak to the kids. Um, but I certainly uh, always advocate for like, the reality is they might not want to be called out at all. They might feel comfortable. They might not. So that's uh, you doing a little bit of digging, but um probably indirectly is always uh, easier and, and utilizing the resources around you or the captains to try to get some information without alienating kids um, in that situation. So it's important to kind of take those situations differently and then learn how to navigate it. But again, that's a part of coaching with any kid of any color because um, that should be something we're doing as coaches all the time is figuring out how to coach a certain kid, what works, what doesn't work. Um, how to create relationships because they're all different. So um, for coaches that are always so afraid to address those issues or uncomfortable, the reality is you're doing that all the time anyway, most likely. Um, and a one size fits all approach just doesn't always work. So as you navigate that, use the coaching tools that you already have in place because they work with anybody regardless of their color just to figure out how to relate to kids and what works best. Well, Matt, I'll just uh, I'll, I'll say I'll say you know that was my question that I posed. It's my team, so I've been you know you're, you're kind of addressing the person who posed the question. So I'm taking it, listening uh, intently. Um, I'm I'm very fortunate to have that uh, that ratio. Like you said, it's um, particularly in Arizona. Um, you know, we're not inner city Phoenix. We're um, on the outskirts. We're a predominantly white neighborhood, and so it's just. Um, I look at it and I, I think in, in three, those three players, um, the black players on my team, they're the top five players on my team. You know, they're, the, they're the best athletes. Um, they're all, you know, possibly they've got opportunities to, to possibly go division one. Um, and so when I look at it, I think like, wow, I'm really lucky. And what did I do to create that opportunity to have them here? And I, I can't take credit really directly for any of them. Um, they started playing, um, in middle school before they got to my program. But, um, but I do, you know, I, I try to create that opportunity like Chaz mentioned and, you know, if there's the one or the two or the two or the three kids that are different, you know, that I try to make them feel, you know, you know, as included as we possibly can. But I still look at it from a perspective of being the administrator over the high school league is why aren't more teams have some of these kids on their team too? And why aren't they more inclusive? So that's why I'm, I wanted to pose that question of like, what can we do? What can I do to get other coaches in our area to, um, to help kids feel comfortable and to get them, uh, give them the opportunities to feel, want to come out and play. Um, but I am, I'm, I'm really fortunate to have, um, you know, we literally just, <coughs> one of the coaches landed in our, in our neighborhood from Minneapolis. 
um, this year. A um, young guy, 23 years old, and um, he saw one of our other parents wearing a lacrosse shirt. And he said, oh, I, I, I played lacrosse in college. And the parent right away was like, well, then you got to come coach with us. You know, like you, you got to meet Dan and you got to come out and coach. So I just, I wanted to hear from other people's perspective what the, um, you know, what that recipe is to kind of encourage that growth. And, um, you know, it's, again, I'll say it again, I feel fortunate when I look and I count the numbers that I have, but um, I know there's a lot of other people that I work with that are, you know, they want to know also. And so um, I'm going to certainly spread the, um, the link to this uh, you know, webcast that Matt put together, trying to get people to, uh, to be open up to uh, hear your guys' perspectives. Yeah, and I got to apologize for you guys. I, I had a little recording issue. I, I, I knew this was going to happen. At least it didn't happen until the third one, but um, I definitely missed some of our key points. And I, I just put a note out. If we can keep going, if you have to go, just let me know. You can do the chat room thing. But if we can keep going, I'd appreciate it. And I'm going to um, kind of backtrack a few here. You don't have to say the exact same thing, but I apologize to the audience as well. Just had a little technical issue. Um, but I, I like the feedback about the, this little scenario that Dan had brought up. And um, I know from one of the previous calls, uh, one of the coaches who, who's the head coach of Division I, and she's black, and she uh, has an annual chat with her team. Um, and she said it's a lot different for her because she is a, a, a black woman that's a head coach of the Division I team. Um, so she, she said to, she said, admittedly, she said, I actually, when I go out recruiting and I see a black player, I target her right away. And that's a little prejudice on my part, but I know what she's gone through, you know? Um, so that was kind of a, a funny, but she was being serious. You know, she, she at least reaches out to that person to let them know, I've been, you know, I'm looking at you and we're here for you if you want to come. But she has a team that has, uh, I can't remember the percentage, but it's not like a 50-50, but she's got plenty of uh, white and plenty of people of color on her team. And she has this conversation and, and to everyone's point, I think Chad, you made it earlier quite clearly, it's an ongoing thing that she's, she's doing and she finds herself sometimes in games or, or situations and has to kind of uh, almost, you know, hold her tongue because she, she wants to speak on behalf of maybe one of her players uh, in whatever situation the game is in. So it's definitely an ongoing thing, Dan, and, uh, and uh, I believe what you're saying. So I want to go back over, and I, again, I apologize. Um, we were talking about our organizations in general, and I think Rory and Ken summed it up really nicely about what they're doing. Um, and Ken, if you can, again, revisit, I apologize, from the MCLA point of view, what you're doing at Georgia Tech as a, as a member of that institution, what you're doing with your diversity program and, and with the kids uh, on a semi-annual basis. Um, yeah, it started, you know, as, uh, um, about five five years ago or so with the One Love Foundation uh, came to visit us and we've had them come back a couple times since then uh, just to kind of, you know, continue to try to educate our kids even more outside the classroom than they, you know, they're, they're engineers and they're, they're solid engineers, they're good at that, but, you know, we try to keep them, you know, sort of involved or educated in other areas as much as we possibly can. Uh, we also work with some local area groups, obviously Morehouse College is right down the road. We've done some stuff with them, at least on the field. And again, this, this is a great opportunity for us to really examine that relationship to figure out, you know, how we can do more off the field. Uh, again, just trying to continue like other people have mentioned in terms of, you know, developing more about our players, getting them ready for, for the real world experiences and, and, and just making them better individuals. I mean, I think that's what we've always tried to do is, is make sure that we're turning out uh, some fine young men as, as best we can as they enter the real world uh, and start taking on jobs and families and everything else, but understanding what society needs from all, from, from their port, from their part. Uh, and so related to MCLA, um, you know, the, the important thing is we, as we've found about is the fact that there's a great diversity across the nation, you know, whether it's, you know, a large school, small school, places like Atlanta, places in the middle of, you know, nowhere. Um, you know, there's a, you know, there's a really big diverse population of players um, with different life experiences that can also be shared. I think that's what's neat about just the college experience itself is the fact that, you know, you've got folks from, from all walks of life uh, and they can certainly learn from one another and share those experiences 
Um, and, and, you know, we as the NCAA are going to certainly, you know, look at some great initiatives we can certainly provide our players. But like Chaz uh, mentioned earlier, you know, we, we can't let this be a one and done thing. We can't just provide, you know, one opportunity um, for our for our members and so they can, like you said, check that box and, and feel good about themselves. It's got to be a, a much deeper uh, conversation that we have have overall that we can provide our groups. Now, it doesn't mean, you know, we can lead them to water. We can't force them to do it, but we certainly hope they'll see these great opportunities that are out there um, you know, to make themselves, again, just, a, you know, a, a better person, you know, after they leave their experiences in the MCLA. Right. And, and Rory, um, if you would, you know, expand on what you were uh, saying about your Legends program and your relationships uh, that you're building with, with certain people of color and leadership roles and such. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think um, the root of the way I look at this is, you know, my belief that experience is a real driver uh, to your, to the mental, the attitude you bring to everyday life and, and certain experiences over the course of uh, your life will craft the way you now view the world. So, you know, one of the ways that we try and embrace that concept and, and make a difference is by making sure that there are people um, of color in power in positions of power within the context of what we do, which is making sure that they're coaches and they're role models and they're leading by um, both by example, but making sure that they are engaging with the kids and giving opportunity. You know, I mentioned, you know, working with a guy like Kyle Harrison, who's been uh, a very good friend of mine, as well as somebody who I think has embraced uh, that role and that position. You know, it's been rewarding, but it's also been educating for myself. And, you know, I've learned from him. And as I you know, learned some of those lessons, and make sure that we emulate it over and over. And we put other guys and maybe some younger guys who will be carrying the torch. Um, you know, at Dane Smith, I just talked to this morning, a Pat Young, who's done an outstanding job coaching for us, making sure that those guys that are maybe a little, you know, Kyle doesn't like to admit it, but he's older now. And he's, he's a guy that maybe some of the kids – don't remember watching when he was at Hopkins, right? But they do remember Pat or Romar Dennis or or other guys who Mario Max Davis, uh, Ben and Benbury, other guys who are part of our coaching staff. Maybe they weren't all Hall of Fame players, but they understand the, the pulpit they stand on. They understand the opportunity they have to create experience, you know, to send kids back home with. And and for me, one of the pieces I really relish is back home for these kids is. About 22 kids were in a jersey. It's more often than not 22 different hometowns and 22 different local programs. And and it's a way that I truly believe if you can help a kid have an experience is that, that open their mind up and educate them, they will leave and they will replicate that in their hometown setting and they will become leaders. So looking up and seeing the right people in the positions of power, I think is uh, super important and not only uh, for the, the player and the athlete of color, but also for the white athlete to look up and, and respect that person and learn from that person and, and get all the same examples and the same experience that uh, the kids around them are getting. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of that. And, and what I'm seeing through firsthand experience is it's working. It, it's there one case at a time. I would say right now I'm listening and seeing these people, uh, they're growing in front of us, you know, and, and what Chaz does on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, and what a lot of everyone on this call does in one facet or another, um, it starts at that micro level, having one more family and one more kid open their minds up and change their attitude. And then that begins to grow, you know, and Mike seeing it two sides of the country. I'm seeing it on weekends where uh, I get a bunch of kids together and then they go back to their home place and everyone has their own, um, vantage point and how they how they view it but if we all embrace i think the micro part of this making those individual changes uh, and setting those individual examples the future is going to be bright and these kids will it'll be their way of life and that's really what we have to get to where this isn't you know the conversation that we all want to have it's because everyone's embraced the lessons that we're trying to push forward and the experiences that that people have shared who have been in those positions so you know specifically that's how we're approaching it and making sure that you know, we, we present the right image with the right people and they understand why they're there. And, and so far, um, you know, I, I, I respect and I give kudos to a lot of the guys uh, that we put into those positions. You know, Kyle came to me yesterday. I want to do team 18 for girls. I want this to go further. I want it to be more than what it has been. Right. And it's just, 
another step in the right direction of creating uh, an understanding of that base level of the pyramid that the kids and families can then grow with. So uh, that, that's what we're looking at. It's one way we look at trying to help and trying to continue to be supportive of this, of this mission. And, uh, and we look to be creative going forward and find more ways that we can interact and engage with the youth. I appreciate that, Rory. Um, and I know, and again, folks watching, we had a little technical, well, I had a technical issue, not we. <laughs> so we are recovering some of our, our topics here and I wanna um, throw the ball to, to Ebony to allow her to um, explain the U.S. lacrosse offerings that are free. Um, so Ebony, if you would, again, for the audience to uh, cover that. Yes, yeah, so about two years ago, we created our cultural co competency course. It's about 90 minutes in its entirety, but you can um, come back and take, a, take one chapter, then go do something else, come back. So um, it covers a lot of different topics, which I think are pertinent to our society right now. Um, it covers bias, um, talks about microaggressions and how those affect uh, coaches and um, your students. Also talks a little bit about social class and privilege. Um, and then it wraps into inclusive leadership. And so I think it's important um, in today's society because it not only discusses um, different ways that you can um, demonstrate prejudice, uh, but also then gives you tools to combat some of those ideals that you've had probably most of your life as a coach or a program leader um, and ways that you can be more close, inclusive in your best practices and the way that you support your team. And so, um, like you mentioned, it's free to all coaches and program leaders. Um, it's strongly recommended. Um, a lot of the leagues have had success that we've worked with. Uh, the PLL has mandated it for all of the people that um, – play or coach for their league, um, the MLL as well. Um, so there has been a lot of um, just understanding of the significance of this course and the value that it can provide for people who are really looking for answers. Um, and it's relatable because it's uh, lacrosse specific um, and um, pretty digestible. So I, I, it's a, a great opportunity for anyone to take the course, especially students as well. Um, it allows them to kind of challenge what they're seeing in the world right now and how that impacts them and the way that they think and how they can also advocate and support their teammates um, and also advocate for a more inclusive environment, um, even as a student. So um, there's a lot of good digestible things in that course. And we also have um, our diversity and inclusion best practices, um, which give uh, very um, implementable ways to create a more inclusive environment as well. Um, it also comes with a toolkit for leaders. So not only does it give you suggested strategies, but then you can use the toolkit alongside of it, um, which is really helpful for league leaders um, and also administrators just to kind of go down and talk about, you know, do we have an inclusion statement? Um, are we inclusive of who we bring on our staff and our board? Uh, it allows you to kind of just look at all areas of your organization and kind of check the box. And if not, you know, look at ways and, it recommends strategies to help implement new things into, into your programming and the work that you're doing. So it holds you accountable and gives you very structured ideas that you can utilize when you're working with your staff. So I think both tools are, are really helpful and we've gotten good feedback on both. I like it. It's important for everyone to know that that's out there. Uh, I'm halfway through it. Just proud to say I just started yesterday because I felt like you were going to get on the call and ask me that question. <laughs> so. I apologize. Um, and again, and uh, it was my fault. And I'm so sorry for you guys and I respect your time. So I'm asking you to repeat some of your stuff. So I want to go back to um, Mike Levin and Chaz. I thought it was very interesting that you guys were obviously you're both at Brown at the same time. But if you would, uh, Chaz, talk about your team experience. And then Mike, if you could restate your reaction or, you know, your, your take on that team experience. Well, well I appreciate it. Yeah, well, I was an attackman and Mike was a goalie and we invited him to our attackman <laughs> dinner. Now I know why he didn't come Still over. didn't want to hang out with us. Um, no, I was just mentioning, uh, you know, and, and my experience is, is not necessarily like everybody else's experience. In fact, we've talked about this with our Nation United guys a lot because uh, take, for example, uh, Pat and, and Isaiah's experience at Maryland was drastically different than mine at Brown. 
Um, and, and it's just two different team dynamics and culture dynamics and, and how they operated. I like to think that I, I had a lot of good friends at, on my team at Brown. Mike's one of them. Um, but I chose uh, very consciously to, to not hang out with the lacrosse team um, very much during my four years. I think as I got older, when I became a, a junior, uh, and certainly my senior year, I hung out a little more because uh, I just felt like from a lacrosse standpoint, from a leadership standpoint, that was important. I needed to do that. Um, but socially, uh, I had a whole different group of group of friends and a whole different circle that, that I ran with. And um, that was good for me. It was good for me for, for a number of reasons. One, it, in, in part, it was just because the times that I had hung out with the, with the team, all good guys, but I just didn't really enjoy myself. I wasn't, that wasn't my experience. Um, but two, it kind of helped me stay interested in lacrosse. It kept me from being um, burnt out, actually. Um, I needed to get away. Like, you spend time in film, you spend time in workout, you spend time on a bus, you spend time in practice do all this stuff together. For me, I needed that, that little break. I needed to be able to step away and step into a different world. And then it was also important for me, having been in a predominantly white institution from first grade to 12th grade, to kind of connect with the black community there. That was important for me. And that's not gonna be the same case for every you know, black player that, that, that plays in college um, or plays on any team, really. Um, but for me, it was. Uh, and so that was that was really a, a big piece of my college experience and my lacrosse experience as well was stepping away from the team uh, as much as I could. Right. Mike, how, how, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so just, um, it's interesting we find ourselves on this panel now and, you know, with the awakening that's happening in the country around issues of race and racism, I think we all find ourselves um, looking inward and saying, like, what are the things that I have done? What are the things that I could be doing better to make the world a more just and equitable one? You know, and I and I spend some time thinking about um, the years that Chaz and I were teammates and and kind of like you know, tr trying to think about them with some humility and reflection and say like, wow, like what, what was Chaz's experience like? You know, I don't think I was really asking myself that as a 19, 20 year old kid. I think I was, a, I was a good teammate. I tried to be a good teammate to everyone who was my teammate, you know, but I wasn't thinking about what might have been unique about his experiences or what ways I could have reached out or like, you know, honestly, it's like now I have had this experience where I've, I've known a lot more people from a broader range of life experiences because I'm older and I spend a lot of time in low income inner city communities, which is nothing like the place that I grew up and my life has been so enriched by it. So now I look back at it more as like a missed opportunity. Like I could have really engaged with Chaz and like I would have grown a lot and I'm sure I would have had a really great experience. And again, it's not to say that I don't think I was trying to be a good teammate. It's just that I think that we all could do a little bit more. And um, the point was made earlier about the role of the coach and I think, you know, had we had a coach of color on that team, I think they could have helped with that a little bit, you know, and I, I, and I think our, we all shared responsibility to say like, you know, I just, I just think about every little experience that happens as a college lacrosse player, you know, you're in the weight room, you're on the bus, you're all these meals, you're traveling together. And just like every one of those experiences, um, you know, Chaz experienced as a black man. And I didn't. And like that was that was must have been a little bit different for him. And I just don't th I think that I and our other teammates could have done more um, to make it a more inclusive environment. Like Jazz has talked, like you set the culture for your team. And I think I could have my own experience would have been quite enriched if I had like reached out a lot more and like like learned from Chaz and like interacted with people that were different from me and just like been a part of his like social experience at Brown. Um, that would have helped. That would have been really good for me, you know. And so, um, you know, I think it's important now as the country is having this awakening to just spend some time reflecting on on that kind of thing. Yeah, and, and I, I think you know to that point, Mike, it, it is about it is about that experience, right? And and that in, enriching. 
Um, and that's what I was talking about, even with younger players, right? The more different experiences we can bring to the table and, and learn from, the better off we're going to be. Um, you know, f- for me, I, I, I can't say that I – routinely ever felt like an outcast like I said I I also know that I was very uh you know I my decisions were very conscious um but I also think about you know Mike talks about the the you know the experiences you've had as an adult and how that's drastically different if you think about black players and players of color in, in the lacrosse world um I I can say with a pretty decent amount of certainty. It, it's a speculation, but uh, and you guys feel free to correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. But most of the players I've played lacrosse with have one or two or three, four black friends, like at all in life. Growing up in in the lacrosse world, I've got hundreds of white friends, mm-hmm. right? And I'm one of somebody's only black friends. Right? That's a whole different experience that, that, that we have to take into consideration. And just imagine, again, coming back to what Mike was saying, imagine not so much how, um, you know, because Mike is a great teammate, great friend, was a great captain, great player. Every, like, of all the people, I've got great things to say about Mike Levin. Always have. But imagine what his experience would be if he had stepped out of his comfort zone a little bit and gone to see any, you know, one of the, you know, dozens of, of different speakers that I went to see or, you know, programming that, that happened in the black community on campus, um, you know, that would, and think about how that would have informed some of the things that he's experienced now in his later life, just in doing the work that he's doing. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that's the type of thing that I think is important for us to recognize is we've got to, in, we've got to invest ourselves in other communities and other experiences um, because that's going to tremendously benefit us, but it's also going to tremendously benefit the people that we're working with. One of the things, go ahead, Mike. I was going to say one of the things that I talk about at Harlem Lacrosse sometimes when we're talking about certain initiatives related to diversity, equity, and inclusion is like, I think there is an ethical component. We should be doing these things because it's the right thing to do, but there's also a strategic component. Like, we are going to be better at serving the kids of Harlem Lacrosse if we have a more diverse set of people amongst our leadership team who have a different life experience and different perspective to bring up, bring to it. And that's like, it's not just that we're doing this because we believe it's the right thing to do. It's actually like a strategic imperative. We can only deliver the best possible program to our students if we have a different group of people at the table. And um, that's like what Jazz was just saying, you know, like I, I, there's no question I would have had like a more complete experience as a student. Like what, it, it's like the perfect time to be experiencing that kind of thing. Uh, as an 18 to 22 year old kid. And, uh, you know, that's like, it, it would have had strategic value to me in the sense that I would have made my college experience more complete. I would have learned more, which is like the whole point of going to college. So uh, uh, appreciate that. Well, that's, that's, um, as we mentioned, education, it's where you grew up and it's, um, you know, your first experiences. And we're talking at the point of reference from lacrosse. So it's where you grew up. If you play New Rec League that was mixed and you were, you know, fortunate enough to have a community where black, white, you know, people of color all played in the Rec League, it, it would be a different view for you when you're 18, you know, but if you've only been at certain exposure levels. Um, Summer, your Detroit program, uh, it, you know, from the women's standpoint uh, in the Detroit program, how are you relating to the young ladies and how are you getting them attracted to the game that is brand new to them and it's the only team that the school's ever had? Yeah, I think it's really unique down here in Detroit, um, specifically because lacrosse, other than its native roots, hasn't been in the city before, really on a larger scale. Um, I was lucky, specifically when it came to Cass Tech, that Um, There was a player who had moved back to Detroit from Georgia who had had the opportunity to play lacrosse down in Georgia and he really wanted a lacrosse team at his school and his mom was pushing for it. She really wanted it to happen for him. Um, And so there was a boys program that was started up at Cass Tech the spring before um, last spring 
just just a year ago. Um, and the young women at CAST that I have been really lucky to coach are very fiery and they were adamant that if the boys got an opportunity to do something, they needed the same opportunity. Um, why did the boys get something that they don't get? They didn't understand that. So they themselves were asking the folks around them, the administration, um, how, do we, how do we get a lacrosse team? How do we get involved? Um, and I just happened to go help out one day for the boys to teach them how to catch and throw. Anybody, anybody who has some lacrosse experience can do that if you've gone through basic training. So I was going to like lend my services just to help out. And I come across some girls basketball players in the gym. They're like, I want to learn, like teach me, like I'd love to play. Like I see the boys doing it. I would really love that opportunity. So I ended up then talking to the assistant principal and that turned into him saying like, well, we don't have anyone to coach. Like, you know, we just don't know if there's anyone that's going to be interested in leading this program. Like if you ask, we'll, we'll make sure that we get people. Like there are so many people that would love to teach lacrosse here, would love to teach these kids who are so excited. On a larger scale of getting young women engaged in the sport, um, I think in general, there's a lack of sports for young women, um, especially in, uh, in Detroit here, there's football, for boys, basketball, that's it, that's some girls play basketball too. Um, but in terms of larger scale opportunities for young women, athletics is not something that's pushed. Um, there's cheerleading to support the football. Um, and, you know, occasionally we'll see girls out. Um, I mean, I live in Island View, Detroit, which is on the east side. Um, and so there's, in my neighborhood, there's um, a recreational center and a basketball court. And there's almost never any young women. It's almost all young men, which is great. Love to see young men out there. But when I start having conversations with my neighbors, all the girls are at home. They're not really active. They say they're not athletes until they get something in their hand. And they're like, wow, this is fun. I really like this. It's just, they haven't been given the opportunity to do something. There aren't many options. So it's more giving kids the opportunity to do something they like. And then some kids hate it. They play for five minutes. And they're like, yeah, no, this is not for me. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the playground and swing on the swing set. And that's totally fine. But it's about giving that opportunity to get a stick in the hand and to say, you know, hey, we have a, we have an opportunity here, a program here where you guys can make friends and have fun. Um, and that's the whole point of the sport here. Um, but like I said, it's because the girls really wanted to play was the whole reason why the cast team specifically got started is they, they saw something and ran after it. And since then, you know, that attitude has really been reflected in the work ethic that they have. Um, every single day they show up to practice. They're like, I'm here for a reason. I'm choosing to be here. I'm excited to be here. Um, and that has trickle down effect. Our high schoolers help teach our youth. They are the ones that, you know, are coaching at the rec centers to get kids involved. All of that build on each other to create a whole community of lacrosse that's really Detroit-based um, and not people that look like me. Like my stint in the leadership that I, position that I'm in should be short-lived because there should be someone from the community who learns the sport now, because they have the opportunity to, to take my role and then have it be a city-based initiative um, I'd love to still be involved in the future. That's not what I'm saying. But it's it's just that like there's always room for folks within the city to really rise up and be the people at the top. Um, and that's the whole point, is it for it to be a community-based initiative, um, not have people come in from the outside to run a program and then leave again. Mike, Mike Levin, excuse me, Harlan Lacrosse. Um, you're you're kind of on that same angle as trying to get more of your community parents involved, if I understand correctly? Yeah, I mean, I, I started working at an organization uh, called Metro Lacrosse in Boston in 2007. And I've been working at different institutions, organizations that are doing something similar since that time. And I think engaging parents has always been um, an important priority and not one that we've always lived up to in terms of like um, meeting our goals there. But we've had many, many amazing parents that are, um, really engaged and many great parent coaches. And now we have some parent board members um, and we're looking to advance that more. Um, so I think I, that's kind of, I, when I heard Ebony was talking about her experience as staff and leadership of the organization of US Lacrosse, that's one thing that I hope 
I hope will help us push some of these initiatives forward um, properly is to like have like the leadership structure of the organization change a little bit that will help us prioritize things more like parent engagement. Um, but I think, uh, you know, it's, I, I don't think that there's any sort of like secret sauce to getting parents involved, you know, like we, we really do a much better job when we have parents engaged in their kids experience. And I think we are better coaches when we have parents who are on the coaching staff. So I think it's just about like having great relationships in the community in which you operate and like, like summer was hitting on just like, you know, we really want to be a program that is of the community that we serve, not sort of like so people who are coming in from the outside. I mean, that that's one of the reasons why we operate in schools. Like we are, we hire people and embed them in a school. They're in the school every single day. So we want them to really be a part of the community. And we've, we've done a lot to um, kind of like advance our assistant coaching staff with school personnel. You know, a lot of, we have a lot of great people who are working in the school in one capacity or another who might not have a cross background that we'd like to engage. That's been a good pipeline for actually for some full-time positions as well. So um, I think we're, we're trying to think strategically about our entire talent pipeline, including board, full-time staff, part-time staff, volunteer positions, and do we have a sort of a racial equity lens in all of that work? Um, that's a big job, you know? And um, so we're trying, that's all I can say. <laughs> Got some yeah, great parents out there though. The trying is, uh, that's the first, first leg of this, is just getting the inertia going, and that's why we're here. Um, unfortunately, we had we lost Chad's Woodson. He had to run. He was overtime, and again, it's my fault for going over our allotted time. So, if as you guys have to, oh, there's Chaz. Okay, you're on mute. On mute. Yeah, no, I just got I got a couple more minutes. I'll stay. Oh, okay. Like two okay. minutes. Two minutes. Well, Chaz, why don't you um, give us a <laughs> closing <laughs> thoughts? Perfect, yeah, perfect give, timing. Give us some closing thoughts. Let us know. Uh, you know, more Nation United thoughts. I'm all, I'm very interested in your program. Man, um, you know, I, I don't know about the uh, a full line of closing thoughts. I think my my major thought would be, again, we, we all have to dig into this work. This can't be a one-off thing. It can't be a check-the-box thing. It's got to be something that, you know, we're really serious about and that we do for the long term. And that's especially, you know, we have to look at ourselves at ourselves as as educators, right? This isn't, you know, we're entrusted with young people's lives, right? And we're we're shaping young people. We're not just showing up and teaching them how to catch and throw a ball. Um, you know, as coaches, they're going to spend a tremendous amount of time with us, and and we're responsible for what comes out of that time. So it is important that we do this work. It is important that we invest ourselves in it, and that we we grow and become, um, you know, real educators for them. Um, as far as Nation United, uh, I, I'm not 100% sure what, what you want me to say about it. Uh, ask me a question, I'll gladly answer it. I think that's probably easier. Yeah, for those, you know, for those that don't know or haven't looked it up, um, just give me the quick premise, as much time as you have, the quick sure. premise around the idea uh, sure. and, and how and make sure, and I know this, but let's be clear that it's open to everybody. Um, sure. Yeah, Nation United, uh, the, the short version of this is, is uh, we created a program, we launched it in 2000, I think 16, summer 16, um, and the idea is to showcase uh, diversity at the highest level of competition in order to help uh, expand diversity in the game. And, um, you know, we roster typically two teams, actually, and we do a women's team as well. Um, but on the men's side, two teams, a junior or a senior team and a junior team uh, done by class, and we compete twice a year. So we try not to pull kids from their other club programs, um, but we do pull kids from all over the country. Uh, and, you know, some are, some are committed to playing in college already, some are not, uh, especially now that the, the rule change has been uh, instituted. Um, but we're pulling kids. At, the best kids that we can find um, 
and, and rostering them together to go out and compete and to show what we believe uh, lacrosse really should look like. And to that end, we, we have kids, like I said, from all over the country, but all different shades, all different backgrounds. Um, and they're phenomenal people. That, that's really what it boils down to. Everybody's got to complete an application. We look at every single application. It's not just, um, you know, it is open to everybody, like you said, um, but it's not just based on film. Um, you know, so we, we try to put together the best mix of players that we can put together to still compete at the highest level we can possibly compete at. And then, you know, we bring them together and we have these type of discussions with them and, you know, we, we do programming for the parents as well. Uh, you know, COVID and like I said, the Zoom era has um, prompted us to do more programming than, than we actually have the last three years. Um, and so, so we're building this thing out the right way. And uh, we, also, we also are working with kids. We're, we have to do a little bit better, um, but we're working with kids once they get to college as well to kind of set them up again long term. Uh, talking networking, talking career options, and um, just just providing ways for this game to really fulfill the mission that we always uh, promote, you know, in, in terms of setting kids up for life. Yeah, and that's that's something that is, I know I grew up with the sport and that you were able to um, network greatly with and it was always you know you you come back to your club program and you can get summer jobs and you can get professional jobs and things like that so i applaud all your efforts i know that my little technical glitch has caused us to run way over in our time commitment so i just want to go around the horn whoever's left chaz just signed off i'll let everyone just say a parting word and then we'll just have you all back uh in a couple of weeks because um it, it just you know it was my fault we had such a great first 40 minutes of the conversation that I didn't capture. So I'll let uh, uh, Ken, I know you've got repair people there. So if you want to say something and, and then we'll come to you, Mike Allen, we'll just work our way around. Yeah, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to join a, a, a great group here with some, some great insight and information for us, you know, at least from the MCLA perspective, you know, like Chaz was saying, I mean, we all, we're educators. I mean, we're, we're coaches, but that's what we're doing. We're, we, get, we get a lot of really impactful time with our players as coaches at the level we are. And so it's really important for us to, to be sure we're, we're always trying to better these young men and, and really, you know, it's, again, it's in the end, it's better that they're great young men, you know, great men in the world uh, than they are great lacrosse players. Uh, you know, that, that, that will come, but you know, if we can do more with them off the field, then and even better. So it, it challenges us in this day and time uh, to look internally in the MCLA and figure out, you know, what we can do uh, to provide our members, um, you know, opportunities to, again, enrich their lives and enrich themselves and, and make them better people overall. So we're, we're excited about this, you know, you know, the journey we're, we're getting ready to start as a, as a group and, and hope to see some, some really positive things come out of this. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Mike Allen. Sure. Yeah. Um, just listening to uh, Chaz and Mike talk about their experiences at Brown on a, you know, an individual level where, you know, sort of looking back, they realized how their experiences could have been enriched by interacting more. And I think it, it sort of makes me think about the lacrosse community as a whole. Um, there are great, so many great things going on in lacrosse and so many great programs and, you know, and everybody's sort of got their own lanes. But I think the more that, you know, those lanes intersect and there's more interaction, um, I think it will enrich the game, the game and uh, make it a better experience for everybody. Um, just to, you know, from the competitive clubs to the, you know, the youth programs to everything, the more that we ingrain giving back and interacting and, and um, sort of overlapping our efforts to what we do, um, you know, I think that's what will really push the game forward and make this more of uh, a game for everyone and, and make that, um, you know, much more evident in what we see, you know, on fields all over the place. Uh, the other thing I think about just from a leadership perspective is, um, you know, is to be, you know, make sure that we are stating our purpose uh, in terms of inclusion and, um, you know, how we want our programs to run. I've been fortunate to grow in my role as a coach. When I first started, no one asked me what my core values were. Uh, <laughs> that wasn't part of the first interview I ever had. But uh, in, in throughout my career, I realized how important it is to, you know, state those things and make it, you know, put it in front of my players and make sure they know what it is that, you know, I'm about and, and the hopes that I have for the program. Um, and I think that that 
you know, so, so there's no assumptions. You know, I think I operated for a long time on sort of the good guy principle, where if you know, I was their coach and I was a good guy, that they could assume all these other things were important to me. But um, I wasn't necessarily clearly stating them. And I think that that is something that I've learned is really important as a leader and as a coach uh, to do. And I think that when it comes to these issues of, you know, diversity, inclusion, um, that it's, that it is important to state that now. I think we've learned that and that's one of been that's been one of the key things that's you know come out over the last few weeks especially is that um, you know being silent is not really an option. You know, being an being a, an ally means you have to speak up and you have to make sort of your uh, your intentions known. And um, you know, in terms of you know that being a core value and that being something that is important as a leader to to state and and uh, make a key part of your program, I think that's uh, really become evident and something that I would like to challenge myself uh, to do more of in the future. Yeah. Um, Dan Lennon. Hi, Matt. It's, um, you know, it's always um, pretty evident when you get around a group of coaches or people that have been, you know, part of the game that um, there's that always um, consistency of as a coach, you want what's best for your team. You want what's best for your players. Um, you know, you generally do that because you want to have the most competitive team on the field. But you know, what I've heard, and, and you know, generally, I think is pretty um, common also amongst in, in the lacrosse community is that we want to be good people. You know, we want to um, we're here to coach to be competitive, to have fun in the game. But we also, um, particularly when you're working with younger. Um, adults, you, know, you want to make sure that they get a good experience out of it and that they come away as a better person, not just only a better lacrosse player. So, um, you know, this is evident that um, we're, we're all taking a step to make sure that we're doing the best uh, thing we can possible to address issues that are in our uh, in our community right now. And so, so I appreciate you letting me be part of this and, and for doing this and whatever uh, you know we can do to to help spread the word to uh, make sure that we're uh, addressing the issues appropriately and teaming up to uh, to deal with the adversity that everybody's going through in, uh, in the world right now with you know everything from COVID to racism to drugs. It's a it's a crazy world right now, and um, you know getting together and talking is uh, is only going to help us uh, tackle these issues better. Yeah, and I will um, go to you, Summer. But first, I'll say hi, Mr. Cade. I see you. That's Ken's son. Hi, Mr. Say, say hi, Kate. <laughs> You're on mute. But we'll go to Summer um, and let you say one last word and then we'll close it up. So Summer? Yeah, um, I think going back to like part of our earlier conversation um, with Jazz um, specifically and talking about the privatization of youth sports um, in general, um, this conversation is primarily about racism in lacrosse and race dynamics in lacrosse. And just to highlight that part of the conversation, I think is really important. Um, equalizing opportunity um, and creating more public opportunity, whether that's through um, the funding, public funding of rec centers or even private organizations partnering with recreation centers to create free or low cost programming help in the large term um, scheme of things. That's one of the things that we've worked on at Detroit United. It was going to start this summer if COVID, <laughs> if COVID wasn't a thing, uh, but we'll start next summer for sure, is a partnership with the Parks and Recreation Department to have pop-up lacrosse at least, at least once a week for the entire summer um, at different locations throughout the city. Because like, like Chaz was saying, that's so important um, to to opening up the doors for more, more kids to experience the sport. Not everybody can afford or know about the private opportunities that exist, but people who are in the community, especially in Detroit, and I know we have a whole bunch of different people on this, on this call from you know, private club directors to people involved in events, um, but here specifically for, for, for a nonprofit that works in, a, in an inner city, um, that's really important and key is creating that a uh, larger, larger network of support for kids. Um, and that's not gonna happen overnight. I think that's something that we've talked about. We're dismantling systemic systems here, like dismantling 
generations and years of history um, that has kept a, like a sport, but more like more more broadly, just resources for very few people. Um, and we're trying to break that mold to create an opportunity for everybody, and that happens slowly. Um, but it takes people like everybody on this call and at large um, to continue to do the work that they're doing in order to create those opportunities. So. Again, thanks, Matt, for having us all on. This was really, really cool. I really appreciate this. Well, again, thank you all. Uh, I'm going to let you all sign off because I've had you way over the time limit. And I apologize. We're just going to have you all back. Oh, wait, Dan, did you? Yeah, Dan, you got to say something. Um, we'll have you all back in a couple weeks if, if time permitted. So I'll allow you guys to go ahead and sign off. Uh, I'm going to say a few words uh, in general. And then um, we'll be back next week with our next episode as well. But uh, I appreciate this panel, and again, apologize to you, the panelists, and the, those viewers watching that we, uh, or I had an issue, not we, <laughs> it's an I thing, uh, and I forgot to hit the record button. I was so excited, and we just started talking. But uh, thanks, panelists, so goodbye, Till next time. You guys go ahead and sign off, and um, I will just keep us going here. Thank you, everyone, that was, it was great to have them. And again, for the viewers, I apologize. Uh, I, I had started the call so early that I stopped recording because I didn't want it just to record me sitting in my office. And then I forgot to hit the record button once we got going. <laughs> so I apologize. So you were listening to pretty much the second half of our conversation. And um, we had Summer Aldridge, Aldridge excuse me, that was uh, just signing off. She's from Southfield, Michigan. Uh, she had begun playing at Denison University, uh, so she didn't start till she was in college, graduated in 2018, and then is back at uh, Oakland University seeking a master's or another degree in athletic training, so that's cool. We also had Ebony Preston Laurent from uh, U.S. Lacrosse. She's the current director of diversity and inclusion at U.S. Lacrosse. Ebony uh, began playing at the age of 10 for the community uh, of Westminster, Maryland. She's a graduate of Bonaventure, uh, St. Bonaventure in 2003 with a degree in journalism and mass communications. We had Dan Lannon on the call. He's from, he's now lives in Phoenix, Arizona, excuse me. He was born and raised in Fayetteville, New York. He began playing at the age of 10 to compete with his older brothers. Uh, he majored in psychology and graduated from Syracuse University in 1991. He is currently the president of Arizona Lacrosse. Uh, Youth, uh, the Arizona Lacrosse League, excuse me. He's the head coach at Desert Vista High School. And he also operates a travel club team called Arizona Hot Sauce. We had Mike Levin, who uh, grew up in Pittsford, New York, and uh, began playing at the age of seven. Mike is a 2004 graduate of Brown University, and he is currently the CEO of Harlem Lacrosse. Uh, he's been serving that position since 2017. Uh, we, the call included Ken Lovick, who was born and raised in Baltimore, and he started LAX in the sixth grade. Ken was a 1993 graduate of James Madison University, where he majored in kinesiology. He's the proud dad of Cade, who you saw pop in at the end there, uh, head coach at Georgia Tech Men's Lacrosse, and he is also the president of the Men's Collegiate Lacrosse Association, or the MCLA as they're known. Uh, the call also included Chaz Woodson, who's originally from Virginia. He began playing at the age of nine in Norfolk. And in 2005, he graduated from Brown University with a degree in education studies, focused on human development, and then went on to get his master's in coaching and athletic administration from Concordia University, Irvine, in 2018. Chaz is the current head coach at Ransom Everglades School in Miami. He's the coaching director for Nation United Lacrosse Club, and he's an at-large board member of U.S. Lacrosse. And our final two panelists included uh, Mike Allen, another Baltimore native who grew up the son of a coach and began playing at the age of five in a local rec league. He is a 1998 graduate of Princeton University, where he majored in uh, sociology. Excuse me. Mike is the head coach of UC Santa Barbara's men's team. He is the director of Santa Barbara lacrosse camps and also the director of the Santa Barbara showdown tournament. And we also had Rory Doucette, who was born and raised in Merrick, New York. 
who began playing lax in the third grade. He's a uh, sociology and communications major at Tufts University, where he graduated in 2006. He continued at Tufts, earning a master's degree in education in 2008. Rory serves as the program director of the San Diego Eagles Youth Lacrosse Club. He is the founder of Legends Lacrosse, and he's a proud dad. That was our complete panelists. I do apologize again. We will have them back in uh, about two weeks or so. I'll have them circle back with us. And for those of you watching, we appreciate the support, appreciate the feedback. If you have ideas or questions you'd like to be to pose to the different panels that we have, you can always email us at the email address shown on your screen there, ot at emwf.org. And we're happy to have you send in questions or even ideas for panelist groups if you, or if you want to be on the panel. Um, just send me your contact information and I'll get in touch with you directly. Otherwise, until our next, next week's show, um, stay safe, be well, and uh, just keep, keep educating and keep learning. Thanks for taking the time to watch us. Post a question to the panel by emailing us at ot at emwf.org. We'd love to hear from you.